And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a couple of newcomers to the temple. Crid, the two lead, desi lead designers on the upcoming Kingdom Gun. Um, and both and both connoisseurs, shall I say, of of co of coffee. We have Andrew De Andrew Dezo and Justin Halleck. How are you guys doing tonight? Great, thank you for having us. This is Andrew. Doing pretty good. Mm -hmm. This is Justin. Thanks for having me up. Yep. I guess you arrived just in time, and yeah, I'll take my beatings for making that pun afterwards. <laughs> So, I suppose I'll I'll op I like to open with the humble beginnings. So, with that in mind, um, what what get you what gave you the impetus to start game development? So, Justin probably has a completely different answer than I do, but um, for me, it was, it's I guess pretty simple. I've been a gamer my whole life. Um, I have absolutely no game development experience. Uh, I'm an attorney by trade, and I'm also a real estate developer by trade. Mm -hmm. um, I do commercial buildings in Texas and Florida. Uh, real estate was really slow because of the pandemic. So um, I decided to do something with 2020 instead of turning it into a lost year. And I said, hey, I love video games. I've been playing them my whole life. Why don't I try to make one? Um, so I got contact with Justin. I kind of thought about the different games I could make and thought about a scope of a game I could handle, came up with Kingdom Gun more or less. Mm -hmm. And um, that's per that's the 30,000 foot version of how I got into game development. Yeah. Um, Justin, what about you? Yeah, um, you know, so for myself, I kind of got into it when I was pretty little, I probably like eight or nine years old. Um, I've just kind of been doing it as a hobby ever since. Um, I've worked on a couple other games as well, uh, but for the most part, I'm just working on Kingdom Gun with Andrew at the moment, Andrew and the rest of the team. Oh, all right. And how 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 did this particular idea get um, start get started? Since when Kingdom Gun was pit was um, pitched to, was pitched to me when when Andrew had when Andrew had contacted me, he had made a lot of comparisons to the original Risk of Rain. Was it a case where you guys were just fans of that game and want and wanted to try and do, try your hand at doing your own spin on the concept? So I think it goes back to I mentioned it was really important as a first time um, game developer to figure out a game that you both like and a scope that you can handle. So I kind of evaluated the universe of games that I really enjoyed playing throughout the past decade. Risk of Rain was one of the top of those, at the top of that list. And um, it's not something that's been done quite often. And I actually can't even think of another game like Risk of Rain 1 that's even out there. So the general idea was to take a, a, a concept like that and, and improve it, um, or we hope to improve it, I should say. And so, yes, our game was greatly inspired by Risk of Rain. Mm-hmm. And given th given that obvious obviously it's is more inspired by the first than the second since um, the second game decided to go full 3D and you're going um, sprite based. Um, for now, putting as putting aside the more calculated reasons, um, what is it about trying to about trying to do a roguelike shooter that you that you guys found appealing? So for me, it's to the, the constant pursuit of achieving what I'll call a god run. And that's just becoming so overpowered and so broken that you just speed through the levels, blow up enemies, and you're just this unstoppable juggernaut. And I just found that really fun. Mm -hmm. And now, when it, now that, that does bring me into... Um, into the where into where you guys are going to be differing from the sandbox since 
there's a, there's a lot that can be said that that'll be that'll be familiar i'd imagine you know run, run jump shoot shoot a lot you utilize utilize abilities and um don't and the and on the risk of permadeath but in what ways would you say that you guys are trying to shake up the um, proverbial formula justin you want to take this sure yeah um so just kind of based off the comparison you made to Risk of Rain 1. Um, mm -hmm. So that game, you know, lacked quite a bit of depth, uh, in my opinion. I'm not saying it wasn't uh, a game with some depth of its own, but I, I feel like that genre was just kind of barely touched on, and it, there's a lot more to explore in that, in that Risk of Rain-like genre. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing that we're hoping to do, is to bring a lot more depth and character customization and, you know, variety of runs. Um, as well as a few other things, but that's that's you know probably our main not differentiator, but one of our goals is just to, is to just take the existing concept and like push it further and improve upon it. And in what ways are in what ways are you tr are you in are you intending to have that manifest in terms of pushing the concept further? Sure. Uh, go ahead, Andrew. I have so to yeah, yeah. A um, uh, uh, couple couple ways that we'll, we'll that we've already discussed publicly, and then a couple um, things that uh, we're we're going to save for future updates. But um, a big example is um, not only do we have gun based characters, but we have sword based characters that. Uh, that's been that's unannounced but coming soon we have a magic based character that does not use guns at all that we're implementing actually right now should be playable in about two weeks even before the kickstarter is over mm -hmm. um we have an item upgrade system that's more uh meta progression that kind of breaks rank from the traditional uh risk of rain loop where you just stack items um we have uh different guns swords and etc you could pick up for even more customization so um we're fully integrating a speed run mode with an in-game timer similar to live split we're going to have online fully functional online multiplayer mm -hmm. we're going to be on switch playstation and xbox so um we're going to be localized in every major european language um text text localization that is as far as voice acting we do have voice acting it'll be in english and japanese um but again text will be in pretty much every major european language plus chinese and japanese uh and russian mm -hmm. um so i guess i kind of just rattled off a bunch of bullet points i suppose um but we we feel we have a lot of a lot of content and development in the works that'll dif differentiate our game um, and hopefully be some sort of bellwether within the 2D roguelike shooter um, genre. Yeah. <clears throat> now, you had mentioned you had mentioned breaking you had mentioned breaking rank from the way Risk of Rain does items, where it's where it's one big stack, whereas you're whereas you're uh, taking things a bit differently. Um, what was the reason for go for going with with that approach beyond just doing something? different uh i'd hate to to come up with this grandiose idea or explanation but it really was just to do something different mm -hmm. and it worked out and it was fun yeah. so mm -hmm. that's a simple answer i guess it was fun <laughs> <laughs> that's it yeah a lot of the game we've kind of been letting um like the game tell us where it wants to go more or less uh not that we don't have our own you know creative direction as well but if you make something and you you know, you get a few hundred people to play test it. Um, it's kind of interesting because the game will end up eventually steering itself towards the ultimate goal, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And since you mentioned that you're doing not only gun-based characters, but um, sword-based and magic-based, one thing that I'm always curious about when it, co when it comes to doing those different types, especially in a game like this where you're going to have a large um, enemy count is do is doing so to make sure that one pl that one playstyle doesn't um out doesn't outstrip the others. So I'm cur I'm curious what some of the trade-offs would be 
with the sword and magic approaches that aren't you that aren't going to have the range advantage that obviously um, firearms would. I will say that um, play the game in two weeks to find out when the magic character is in. That's the that's the re that's the official response, mm -hmm. aka. I don't freaking know, man. We're figuring it out as we go right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and to to that to that particular end, I'm, I'm guessing that I'm guessing that the main thing is going to differentiate when it comes to characters that are using um, firearms. Is there is there a host of of abilities? Yeah, so both sword, magic, and gun using characters will all have their own uh, unique abilities. Mm -hmm. um, the differentiator in attack type will be the method of attack. Obviously, gun, sword. Well, I say swords, and that's really interchangeable with melee. Mm -hmm. But uh, so guns, melee, and magic. Um, and there'll be multiple characters in each class. And you know as we get further in development um we we'll be able to develop their identities a little bit more um right now where we're at with the magic based character is we have our full basic animation cycle in plus her basic attacks um plus one ability and as justin was saying um before we're gonna let her speak to us and once we understand how she plays and what what her fun factor is we're gonna start hammering on that avenue and start developing that part of her. So um, it's still a little open ended right now. Mm -hmm. Now, speak. Now, speaking of that, in a lot of rogue, in a lot of roguelike approaches, even though obviously you obviously you go right back to square one once you've um, once you've ended up kicking the bucket. Um, in some cases, you you end up getting something back. It's just it's just to just to a much lesser degree, obviously. Um, do you guys plan on implementing a a similar system to that, where there are where there's things that you're going to be getting, so that somebody playing late game somebody playing late game will 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 start with a bit more of an advantage than somebody just starting yeah. fresh. Yeah, I mean, um, so at the moment in the game, we have you know a permanent currency that's rewarded based on how how well the player does in this each each. Mm -hmm specific run um and that permanent currency is used you know for the meta progression of the game so at the moment that consists of upgrading items um we have tossed around the idea of like unlockables that are you know purchased through currency or even player characters and then of course uh, not really game changing but we've got a couple ideas for different player skins and things along those lines as well mm -hmm. Now, when it when it comes to the when it comes to the um, gunplay gunplay itself, would it be fair of me to assume that you're that aiming aiming is going to be straightforward? This isn't going to be some eight direct some eight direction aiming like like someone's playing Contra. Yeah, that's correct. Um, that was on the list of things that we tried out, uh, and I think with a game that's as fast paced as this, it's just not as fun to to have to aim in either eight or three hundred and sixty you know, degrees. Um, that was one of those things where we tried it and the gameplay itself just didn't get any better for it. So we stuck with the two directions. And I think at this point, we're pretty, pretty darn set on that, at least for the gun characters. Um, it's a little bit up in the air what we're going to end up doing with the, like, you know, melee weapon characters. They may have some sort of directional based attack, but can't really say for sure yet. Yeah. And when it now one of the other one of the other things that i wanted to note when it came to design is like risk of rain i already mentioned but um the other the other part that was mentioned as an inspiration was was final fantasy and i'm cur i'm cur now given the fact that final fantasy has taken many different vi visual um turns over the years i'm curious with i'm curious was it mostly the um Mostly the 16-bit era that was your inspiration. Yeah, so m my favorite Final Fantasies are Final Fantasy six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. So kind of in that uh, six through ten, um, 
is what we were going for for or at least it's for drawing inspiration i should say mm -hmm. in style uh, aesthetic kind of world building however it seems um or at least from my observation on the internet that we've been compared more to metal slug honestly than than anything else and we we didn't actually use metal slug as a reference at all um i tried to use final fantasy as a reference so um it, but I, yeah six through ten if i had to guess i get the feeling the reason why um, people made people made the metal slug comparison um is two things one the one the uh, sense of humor that's in your visual design and two the amount of detail on the sprites is definitely something that people would see in Metal Slug. But since you're not doing multi-directional aiming, um, that kind of disqualifies you from the Metal Slug comparison. Right. Fair enough. Um, now, something else I, I saw it within it is um, is the whole is the whole thing with difficulty. And are you guys going to be doing the setup where um, where cranking up the difficulty is going to give you is going to give people um better odds for drops yeah i think at this point uh you know that's our our plan uh it's not what's in the demo currently but at this point um if we've kind of decided that the higher difficulties will you know be like a risk versus rewards in that area yeah and something something else is that it mentions un unlocking um the other pl the other playable characters through um through side quests which in that regard, is would it be? Is it more accurate to say that they're side quests or side objectives? Um, what we've been using is objective. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there, Andrew. No, go, but, go uh, ahead, Justin. I was gonna say I'll let Andrew take over for this one too. <laughs> okay, I was gonna, uh, I'd say um, I, I, I actually maybe maybe it's some nomenclature, but uh, side objectives or side quests. I, I guess I don't really. Um, understand the difference between the two in the context of our game, but I will say they're probably more side objectives. Um, some characters you will be able to unlock just by naturally playing the game, i.e., you know, beat the first boss, you're going to unlock a character. Um, whereas other characters are going to be a little more complex and secret, so I don't want to give that away too much. Um, but I, I suppose you could categorize them as objective base. Um, the reason why I br the reason why I bring that kind of thing up is something is quest has a as a certain connotation, especially especially if you're talking RPG style quest. Um, and given and given how the main objective in a um in something like a roguelike is just don't die. That's the reason why I um, made the made the comparison to objectives rather than um, quests. It's more of it is a bit of a splitting hairs aff affair. I will freely admit that, but it's one of those cases where these where um the wor the wording can have can have certain connotations, certain implications. You were you were very clear in your exp explanation. Appreciate it, and I can now say, uh, play, c characters will be unlocked through both objective, i.e., this is not an objective, but for an example, stay alive for five minutes and you unlock a character. I suppose that would be an objective. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, there will also be, um, you know, collect this collectible on level one, collect this collectible on level two, which I, seems to be more quest-like, and then you also unlock a character. Yeah. So both. Mm -hmm. And give and given the other th the other thing that I did that I did um, no that I did notice is a degree of um, mobi of mobility effects. Whether whether it be a whole, whether it be a whole lot of jumping or or some sort of dashing, it was mobi was mobility a priority for you when it came to the uh, when it came to your design? Oh yeah, I think that before we even did anything with developing the scope of the game, we made sure to get the character controls down. 
Yeah, it was it was pretty much the very first thing we did is, you know, let's make a a, a platform game where the character is fun to control without being mm-hmm. overly difficult, but still allowing a lot of mobility. Um, we spent, what, probably three months working on a game or like working on the game where it was literally just almost no art. Like we just had a player character and one or two enemies that we just did movement for a while there. And some something else I did something else I did notice that in a lot of in a lot of cases you have um, you have enemies in swarms and that and it gave it gave me the feel that one of the um, th- one of the things that's going to be a big factor for for um, pl- for play as well as for skilled play is managing crowd control. Is that accurate? Yes. Yeah, definitely is. And. The other, the other thing is you meant you mentioned you mentioned for, you mentioned um like beating the being the first boss and the like, and I'm get I'm guessing in that regard you guys are going by um ch- by a chapter based approach instead of just pure waves. Yeah, um, in the demo right now we've got like the first two environments are in there, so you'll transition from one environment and a boss to the next environment, then that environment's boss. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what we have in the demo at the moment. Obviously, we've got plans to do a bunch more environments after those two. Yeah. And when it when it came when it came to when it came to developing your idea and, na- and nailing it down, were there um were there certain ideas that you guys had early on that as you were developing the project um it start were a little bit less vi- were a little bit less viable or things that um you had you felt you that uh, weren't fitting what the game was turning into yeah um that's actually a pretty good question one of the very first things that we started with uh was completely procedurally generated levels um but because the game you know kind of follows that key point uh you know on the map experience like uh i'm not sure how much of the demo you've played but once you launch into the game you know your very first objective is to find an artifact and bring it over to a you know, to the teleporter. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, games that have that as kind of their core mechanic, uh, at first we thought that like a procedurally generated level would fit that. And we got it in and we got it working, you know, well enough to know that it, it was going to be fun or not. And it turned out to just be a bit more frustrating than fun to the player, um, not being able to learn the maps or, you know, never know where anything is ever. Every time you play the run, it's completely different. Um, so I would say... That procedural, you know, like procedurally generated levels are something that we tried originally and it just did not fit the game. Which I I could see, and in my in my in my not so humble opinion, I do th- I do think that um procedure procedural generation of levels or maps is something that I think a lot of a lot of people overrate. I'm not saying I'm not saying the idea is bad, but I do th- I do think some people treat it like a um, miraculous fix, and right. in that regard, it isn't. Yeah, I mean, it fits in a lot of games, and uh, you know, I'm not saying you can't make a 2D shooting roguelike with procedural levels. There's you know plenty of examples of that that exist that are great, um, but it just didn't kind of fit the game we were making. Like I said, the, you know, the games just kind of explained to us that the procedural levels weren't weren't going to be it. And to that to that to that particular um, end, something now obviously I'd I'd noticed that you get that you guys are strictly use that when it comes to uh, character abilities you're strictly using um, cooldowns. And what I what and, I was curious mm-hmm. about is ha- had there been had there been an experiment early on into using some sort of MP system that just didn't work out. Or what? Or were you guys shooting for a cooldown system only from the get-go? We did actually try, you know, kind of not specifically a mana-based system, but one of the things that we tried with Volt Knight, he's got those like mines that he can throw. Mm-hmm. Um, and originally, we went through, you know, where there was a set number of those that you had in your inventory, say ten or something. Mm-hmm. And when you threw those out, um, you had to collect more of that that were dropped by either enemies or in crates. So that's about as close as we got to a mana system, but I definitely wouldn't count it out for some of the future characters. Yeah. Uh, and of course, uh, and of course, 
when it comes to weapons, I do see that you have weapons. You do you do have um, weapons switching, and I'm guessing the I'm guessing the approach that you guys ha you guys are going to be sticking with is ammo is technically unlimited, but reloading is not. Right. And are you only going to be uh, in set in setting up a loadout? Is someone only going to be able to um, have two guns maximum at a time or do you have plans where some where later down the line somebody could increase the uh, weapon the amount of weapons that they can carry right yeah i think that's going to be like one of those things you'll just have to wait for the uh new characters to come out to see um but it's definitely not something we've you know taken off the table mm -hmm. i'm not i'm not saying that's something that somebody's going to have the wep the weapon list that you might see in a doom game or even a doom mod but um I could, but I could see, I could see that potentially expanding for for certain characters. Um, it's, but I could, but at the same time, I could also see it being a trick, being a tricky thing to do because if you do um, too many, then you en you end up with, well, like I say, you, you end up with the weapon selection that you have in Doom, or 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 even going further, even going to further extremes. Now, wh now, uh, when you guys were developing this, did you, did you originally des did you originally start designing this around um, around the PC framework and eventually start to and eventually start to move it to other platforms, or was the idea of going multi-platform with this something you always had in mind? We have been developing it with multi-platform in mind since day one. Mm -hmm. And. Has it been, has it been relatively easy to de to develop on multiple platforms? I I know that there's been other cases in, in the past uh, where some platforms were easier to program for than others. So, as far as the programming side of things, yes, it's fairly simplistic, and that's because Justin is a top tier programmer <laughs> so um but the the real trick with dealing with nintendo or sony or microsoft it's just making sure you have your compliance right and that's that's the real brain damage you go through there um not so much from a programming side of things but just from like for example on playstation this is not an actual thing but just to give you a point um X is always confirm or X always to start game. Mm -hmm. And so we'll have to go through and make adjustments based on, you know, the different compliance requirements for, um, you know, Sony, Microsoft and Nintendo. Mm -hmm. And when, and when it comes to, when it comes to the, when it comes to the uh, setup with the, um, with the schedule that, that's, that was de that was demonstrated. Um, something that something that I'm cu I'm curious about is did is um did you did did you have did you have it planned with with this particular um t with this particular timeline of t of launching and then doing the and then doing these um testings. Uh, sorry, what was the question? Um. Something I'm curious about is the is in regard to the timeline that you ha that you have set set up, um, you know the closed online multi multiplayer beta, the alt the open beta, the final launch test, and so and so on. And what I'm curious about is how, is the um, is when it is the kind of the kind of things that you're hoping to t that you're hoping to test for e for each of those um, betas. Um, I can guess a few of them. Uh, gotcha. One of them being um, one of them being servers, and just just to make sure that um, nobody ends up breaking the thing. Mm -hmm. Um, mainly I'd say, uh, Justin, you probably answer better than I, but probably sure. mostly um, to make sure the networking from the coding side is is working as intended and mm -hmm. fixing any bugs or problems that we come across with that. Uh, and then I'll, just on top of that as well, um, it is super useful every once in a while when you're making a game just to get a nice batch of testers in, because um, you end up getting kind of uh, 
you know, blinded by exposure. If you see the same thing every day, day in and day out for six months at a time, you can very easily uh, miss things that would be very obvious to some new eyes. So every once in a while, it's a great idea just to get a batch of testers in, pass them the game as is at that specific time period, uh, and then just listen to their feedback. Mm -hmm. All right. And now you now. I know that you get. I know that for what for one of you, this isn't your first rodeo, but regard regardless, what would you, what would you say have been some of the big learning experiences when it comes to develop when it comes to developing this? Um. Well, for me, given it is my first game, um, man, I spent a lot of time researching you know, different steps an indie game developer should be taking to be successful. Um, I'd say start your marketing early and often. Um, I credit Justin for that uh, in this case largely because he he wanted to get us uh, push it, push it like a public-facing alpha or, or maybe I shouldn't say public-facing, but a, a select group of private testers in. And this was like, man, this is like 20 days into development. I was like, this, this game sucks. Who... Who the hell wants to see this 20 days into development? And it was one of the best decisions we made. And, and that's kind of what we've been doing since day one almost up until now is constantly pushing new builds, growing the community organically, and getting great feedback along the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would definitely say that probably more than, more than many other things, you know, our players' feedback has definitely been something that's helped shape the game. And when it comes when it comes to the, when it comes to that feedback, is it a is it a case where you um where you have a have a back and forth with the testers every once in a while, or are you are you constantly going back and forth at at every opportunity? Um, our Discord is actually pretty active, so we encourage all of our testers just to message us directly on Discord. And then our Discord server has got you know a feedback channel that's pretty active, and then just our our general chat in there. Um, it's not uncommon just to find us hanging out in a voice chat with five or six just random random members of the community while we're working on the game. Mm -hmm. So I'd say it's pretty constant uh, at this point. But we do obviously release updates to our demo in batches. Uh, so it's not like they're getting, you know, every new feature the instant it comes in. But yeah, and given the, given that. I'm cur I'm curious if the, I'm curious if there's any standout in incidents when it comes to the testers trying to trying to find exploits or trying to find a way to br for for lack of a better term break the game. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, when Peter flew. Early. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we had uh, one of our like first testers. Um, I don't know. Twenty minutes after we pushed the demo, I just get this message from the guy, and it's just a little like a GIF of him literally flying in the game which is not not in the game um so there was a big you know like wait a minute how did you do this and then that guy uh, actually ended up finding quite a few other what you'd call exploits uh, so yeah that's like definitely one of the things <laughs> thank that you peter is great for yeah and whenever that whenever that kind of thing happens part of the reason i end up i end up bringing that up is because I'll, I'll always remember how there's instances where one tiny little oversight can spiral completely out of control. Um, if you need a re if you need a next a massive case in point with that, I'd I refer you to the corrupted blood incident that happened with World of Warcraft early on. <laughs> yep. Um, I'm cur I'm curious if there if there's been one of those cases where one thing that got looked over could could have potentially become a bigger problem. I don't think um, so. Uh, if you allow me to, I'd like to give Justin a little backstory on the corrupted blood um, because sure. he's not—he didn't play. Wow. So, so Justin, there's this, there's this like raid boss that mm -hmm. uh, put this call it uh, disease, if you will, on a player called corrupted blood, mm -hmm. and part of its mechanic is it would spread to other players in range. Right. And so somebody got the corrupted blood and then teleported to like the main city, the main player hub. I'll correct right. you on one. Just... I'll correct you on one thing. Uh -huh. um, what ended up happening is they they found out that P 
pet, that um pets if you were playing if you were playing a hunter could also get infected. Oh right, right. Yeah, you're right. So so in essence, you know, they just it was just a pandemic, if you will, yeah, in the major cities, and the whole server got <laughs> got it's infected with it. Yep. <laughs> it, yeah. it. It permanently got infected with it. Mm -hmm. Wow. Interesting. So, no, nothing even close to, <laughs> to that in this game, yeah. no. Um, Giving me ideas, though. <laughs> <laughs> There's actually, like, I think, virologists, or however you say that, that have um, done, like, actual medical studies on it. Yeah, it, wa oh. it was used as research for, by uh, epidemiologists when it came right. to how people would react to a, uh, to a pandemic at, the, at that level. Um, be obviously, because with how with how big WoW was, and this was and this was during its this was during its really early days, um, you couldn't ask for a bigger sample size for that kind of experiment. And <laughs> and it, I mean, it is a little bit cold to to look to look at millions upon millions of players as test subjects, but it but it do, but it do, it do. Um, and I'm not I'm not saying that ain't that anything has happened with Kingdom Gun that that's on that level, especially since you especially since you guys are in are in a more controlled environment when it comes to online multiplayer. Right. But I was I was curious if there if there was if somebody had figured out some sort of um some sort of prevailing some sort of prevailing strategy or so or just something that that um. Was interp was interpreted in a way that wasn't factored in. I uh, I don't I can't think of anything really, Justin. Besides uh, the flying bug, I can't really think of anything either, other than flying. Um, it's not really a bug, but we've definitely caused some chaos with our debug tools a few times. But uh, you know, nothing nothing unexpected. Well, let's get in. Let's get into that. What can you tell me about the about the flying bug and what exactly happened? Yeah, uh, I can actually answer that one. So there was a player um, who found out that you could jump if your head was touching a ceiling instead of if your feet were touching the floor. Mm -hmm. um, so he was basically flying around the inside of caves, uh, spamming the jump button, which would constantly push him up into the ceiling harder and harder and harder until he'd eventually come out of the cave and just you know launch through the air across the level. Uh, and he could stay flying like that for probably I don't know like a good minute or more. So he 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 found a, he found a way to both no clip and and replicate and replicate the. Um... He never, never actually got no clip working, but yeah, he could uh, essentially convince the character that it was on the ground just mm -hmm. by having its head its head touch the ceiling, yeah. which resulted in just some wildly unexpected movement. Yeah, it's um. Uh... Part of the reason mm -hmm. I part of the reason I'm curious about those about those sort of exploits is because since you mentioned a speed run mode that you're that you're planning mm -hmm. for the game, that kind of any sort of ex, any sort of exploit or any sort of bug is going to get abused. It's not a matter yeah. of if; it's a matter of when. I think that just breaks down to uh, like if you look at any of the major speed running you know forums or boards, they always have like a glitchless mode versus just an any percent or you know any method. Um, for a, a great example is some of the speedrunners beating like Ocarina of Time in three minutes or something along those lines falls yep. into a you know a glitched run. Mm -hmm. But you've also got the people that want to do Ocarina of Time 100% completion glitchless. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you'll always have you know a target audience for both of those. Yeah, and what I'm curious about is what is what ch what particularly changes between a, between a um between playing the game normal and playing the game on speedrun mode cuz something like speedrun mode is something i have seen in a few ga in a few other games most recently mm -hmm. in my case was when i grabbed um the mega man 0 slash Z um zx collection that had that mm -hmm. but what but um what changes as far as the gameplay loop between the two or is it mostly the same just with a time just you just hit the nail on the head you essentially you're gonna have a live split like timer overlaid um that just benchmarks your times um as you kill end of level bosses it'll show you your splits and if you're on pace or behind your your you know 
previous or best pace mm -hmm. and it'll just end with you killing um the final boss yeah. that'll be the official loop and given that given that that also that brings me to one other thing um not too long ago i was watching a speed run of um of resident evil code veronica and the person the person who was doing it had remarked that they weren't weren't fond of the of the way well for lack of a better term rn jesus works in that game and i'm cur i'm curious if when if um when it comes to when it comes to things like da when it comes to things like damage and um ha and health whether whether or not you whether or not you guys are employing very strict amounts of damage or whether or not you guys are em employing some degree of rng with it so I can actually answer that one as well. Um, as far as the as the combat goes that we have in the game at the moment, uh, it's pretty set in stone. The RNG is more related to like item spawns and drops and like which enemies spawn where. Um, but at the moment, the you know, like the actual damage output of things that can hurt the player is very calculated. All right that that makes that makes sense. And I'm I'm so because of that, I'm guessing that um, when it comes to combat critical hits aren't going to be a thing when when something gets hit with a particular type of bullet it's always going to do this set type of this set type of damage in a set amount so right now we have critical hits uh player side whereas the player can get a critical hit on an enemy but the the enemies are not getting critical hits on the player um, i'm not sure if that'll change or not but those are you know you're talking about a pretty pretty small percent of your total there yeah, and at the end of the day, the nature of this game is super RNG heavy, um, mm -hmm. and we love the speedrun community, and we want to put this in, but at the end of the day, um, we're not designing a game around speedrunners, mm -hmm. so um, if we can support them and and whatever, that's great, but we're, we're at the end of the day, we're not designing a game around speedrunners. Yeah. Um. And I'm, I mainly use that as a seg as a segue forward because obviously the other ca the other case I could have gone with when it comes to RNG is the XCOM problem, but <laughs> I don't think you're going to be dealing with that. Where for for reference, XCOM is particularly infamous for how, for how its how its RNG seems to always be skewed against you. <laughs> That's, that's the way it goes. <laughs> hey, it, I think the the scientific term is it just be like that. <laughs> oh, that's just, oh um, yeah, ninety five percent chance of hitting, still miss. Yeah, <laughs> twenty times in a row. <laughs> that's that's the way it goes. Some days. Mm -hmm. Um, it's also the reason why one of the prayers we have in the temple is the dice gods show no mercy. True. <laughs> But now, given now, given that now, given that I mentioned the I mentioned the whole thing with um ch with chapters, and obviously I, this might lean a little bit in the in the uh, spoilery ends of things. But what are you shoot What are you shooting for as far as far as um as far as how many total chapters? Between five and six. A run there. Mm hmm <clears throat> With with secret side areas and whatever, but like it's, if you just went level to level to level, five to six. Five five to six. So that so a um full a full no death run would probably would probably run no more than a couple hours, I'm guessing. Oh no, and an, well so I'm basing this off the only other game type that I know of risk of rain mm -hmm. um and you i believe the top speed runners in risk of rain can do the full loop which i th think is f four maybe five levels in 10 minutes um so and i'm, I'm not too proficient in, in what that entails if it's if that's glitches or not but i would not be surprised to see the top speed runners getting sub 15 minute runs in our game that being said the average player would probably take I don't know forty five minutes to complete a run, but top tier speed runner definitely sub fifteen. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, obviously obviously when I'm when I'm saying that that's that's assuming um obviously no death and easiest difficulty cuz I could see that number I could see that number going up when somebody is going with the harder difficulties. Correct, right. Now t now I do want I do want to take the time to con to um congratulate you on how well the on how well the uh, Kickstarter has done so f so far getting yourself funded in 2 hours and currently at at the time of this recording um at 22.8000 with um 17 days to go. Now one th one thing that one thing that I'm curious about when it came to um when it came to when it came to stretch goals is have in some in some cases I've seen games um end up end up with a bit of a fe end up with a bit of a feature creep problem when it came to str when it came to stretch goals. Is that something that you guys have been mindful of to make sure that you don't bite off more than you can chew, or to put it in a more facetious way, um, don't become star citizen? <laughs> uh, very mindful of um, what we've put in. I'd say the biggest scope creep is um, would be our, our highest tier, which is unannounced, which mm -hmm. I don't believe it at this point we will hit because it's eighty thousand dollars but um everything else that's been revealed at least is not too much extra work um for us so i don't think we will be a victim of scope creep mm -hmm. now when it i did notice that one of the ones that you did that you recently unlocked was the community choice um player character and is that going to be a case where you where where um where people where people would be submitting potential potential designs and then that gets voted on or is it a, or is it more of a step by step screening process? So we have a uh, like Justin mentioned before active Discord channel and we have a channel within our Discord channel set up that uh, anyone can submit an idea for their playable character. We're going to. Um, eventually lock that channel the team will go through all the ideas and pick probably the top four or six somewhere in that range of what we like um and then we are going to do probably a twitter poll and a discord poll add up the results and then whatever the winner whatever the community decides is the character we'll put in the game mm -hmm. is I will admit that when I saw the when I saw the whole community ca created um character thing, one of the one of the instant things that came to mind was a was a similar thing that was done in um Endless Legend when they cr when they introduced the Cultus of the Eternal End as a faction. And that in that case it wasn't one person who uh, did it, it was multiple people who did, who um collaborated separately. And that w and that was the and that that submission was the one that won out and got made canon. Um, now I I um, if I'm not mistaken, you guys are shooting for you guys are shooting for a full one point at least one point oh release in um oct in October. And some at least at least when it at least when it comes to a launch and I and. Based on how you guys have described it and the fact that you're doing multi-platform, there's a couple questions I have on that. One, when it comes to the PC version, is th is this going to be a full-on launch or is this a early access type of launch? Full on. Full on. And the second question that I have is for is for that launch window. Obviously, not a launch date because you because it's way too early for that, and I don't like the notion of counting chickens before they hatch is is that is that launch window going to be the uh, going to be the universal launch window for all um appropriate skews so yeah that's I mean, I the that's, that's the intention <laughs> uh sorry justin yep no problem all I was trying to say is I, I i think the same thing andrew was about to say that's our target is you know a simultaneous release um for all of the all all of the different platforms, but it's still a little up in the air. Exact dates, you know, it, uh, just kind of the way 
the way development goes. If mm-hmm. if everything goes perfectly to plan, then yeah, we'll be launching everything on on the same day. Um, but with ex- especially with launching the console, you know, there's always unexpected delays that may pop up. So I can't really say for sure that we'll that we'll hit everything on the exact same day. But we're gonna try. Yeah. So just to make sure I don't end up jinxing it. Hey, yeah, did you knock on wood? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I, I barely caught that. Yeah, okay. I think Thank I you. Thank you. I got a block for that right on my desk. Yeah, it's, it's. Um, no, it could, I could. It could be argued that I'm being paranoid about jin- about jinxing it, but just because you're paranoid doesn't make you any less wrong. Mm-hmm. That's right. That's right. Yeah, I appreciate it. And given and. Now, some something else. I'm, something else. I'm kind of curious is um, with with something like this. Ob- obviously, this is a game that's get, this is a game that's going to be made for um, for control for controller support. But whenever you're releasing on P- on PC, there's always there's always the possibility that somebody buying might primarily have mouse and keyboard. And I'm, I'm curious if you're going to be putting some sort of disclaimer saying this game. This game plays best with controller or something like that. So it's funny you say that because I hate keyboard and mouse for games, like especially 2D games. I am super pro controller. And this is the first game I play on keyboard and mouse for this this type of game. Um, so originally we did have that in all our early builds. And we've since taken that out. Um, and I certainly could be wrong but i feel it plays spectacularly on keyboard and mouse and controller yeah. as well mm-hmm. especially um you know the our like default key binding i feel is pretty good but we've also let players fully customize their key binds for everything so i think at this time uh keyboard and mouse are pretty equivalent in my book all right i may i mainly ask because some because i i use i use a certain i use a certain program so that i can so that I can so that I can trick my computer into thinking that a PS4 controller is is really an Xbox One controller. Um, but I know I know some people don't have that option. They just have they just have mouse and keyboard. Right. Or if they or I, if they want to be really old school purists, they just have a keyboard. <laughs> I'd say you're you're gonna get a uh, you're gonna probably have a problem if you're on a trackpad laptop. <laughs> Um, at, at that point, the game probably sucks and you need a controller, to be honest with you. But if you just don't have a controller and you just have your typical keyboard and mouse, um, we're very happy with how it plays on that. Mm-hmm. We do actually even have support for people that have a trackpad in there. We have an option to like disable aiming with the mouse and it just aims the same way you end up aiming on a controller. Um, so even worst case scenario, the game still does actually control pretty well on it, just the keyboard. It's like a. It's one. It's de- it's definitely one of those things that I could I could see be, I could see um being a, being the proverbial bullet dodged in the, in that kind of case, and I'm get I I have to. Would it be accurate of me to say that the reason why you extensively tested on on keyboard is because of the fact that most of the time you don't like doing it on keyboard? Oh yeah, we we made that a point for four straight months on getting the keyboard controls perfected. Um, and we, we believe that to the extent they can be perfected, um, they are, honestly. I, we're very happy with how it plays on keyboard and mouse. Yeah, that was kind of a large part of the original like first few months I was telling about where we just did nothing but movement. Mm-hmm. Um, that included making sure it felt good on, on keyboard and mouse or just keyboard or just a controller or whatever whatever input method yeah. you can think of, pretty much. When it came to mo- when it came to movement, since you brought that up, were there in th- in those several months worth of developing that and making sure that to get that as right as you could, were there any part- were there any particular um, quirks with d- with developing movement that ended up being trickier than others to fi- to um, fix? Um, I don't think so. Uh, I'm gonna just chalk that up to myself having a lot of experience doing platformers. Um, and then Andrew, you know, obviously made some great choices originally. Like, um, if you're familiar with the term coyote time, uh, that's something that he, right off the bat, before we even started coding anything, he's like, I, it, you know, needs to have coyote time and input buffering. Um, so like those kind of things were 
planned from the start, and I don't think it was too much of a challenge. It was just kind of more or less play the game 20 times with these controls, play the game 20 times with this different jump height, and then just kind of compare and see what what we liked and what our community liked more. Yeah. Um, now, I'm familiar with the term coyote time, but for the benefit of the audience, could you explain what that means? Yeah, so in its simplest form, um, in a platformer, if you're you know you're doing a lot of jumping from platform to platform, um, if the player doesn't quite have the timing perfect and they you know maybe step off the ledge um, before they hit jump, mm -hmm. there's a little bit of like a window of time where they can still hit jump, uh, even though they're they're now in the air. We're just going to pretend like they're on the platform and launch them up. Um, one of the things that that like we did in in our game that turned out to be very beneficial is we actually have unlimited amounts of coyote time. So you can fall off of an edge, wait like a solid one second if you find somewhere high enough, uh, and then jump still. All right, that 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 definitely makes sense. And since you mentioned time, one of the one one other thing that I um that I'm that I'm very familiar with when it comes to platforms, especially is um bl is some sort of blinking time. Um. And I'm cu I'm curious if if um that's a tradition that this game will be fo will be following the idea the idea of that brief window of invulnerability when you get hit, mm -hmm. so you're so you're not just so you're not just getting um you're not just so you're not just tanking damage that you didn't see. Yeah, yeah, that's something that we've already got in there. Um, and we, you know, we've definitely tried a bunch of different values for that that time period, but I think what we have in there now feels pretty solid. Mm -hmm. Well, I will. I will most certainly be looking forward to seeing how it how it develops and how the um, player base finds new and interesting ways to well break it. But but with nice with that in with that in mind, I do I do want to sincerely thank both of you for taking the time out of your schedule to come to come on to the show. I would say brave the hell of time zones, but. We're in the same time zone, so that's not really a hell. That's right. You're you're not too far from us, mm -hmm. I guess, relative to the other people you interview. Um, and anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around Thank here, you. drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Well, well, next time we'll uh, we'll have a few few beers or whatever your drink of choice is, and we'll we'll just start talking. We'll go off the rails real quick. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I I always expe I always expect things to go off the rails. I am the I'm the kind of person who makes as sim the simplest plan possible so that the pl so that it's not so it's not going to bug me if the plan goes awry because it will go awry. <laughs> All right, nice. Yeah, we we'd love to we love to come back in a few months and see where we're at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay. Fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>